So you can still complete the assignments and solution for module three in CSC 220. Today is Friday, the 27th of October. And uh, what we'll be doing is uh, reviewing our remaining objectives, student learning objectives. We'll be getting into the legal start of this, the law part. So without further ado, does anyone have any questions about the time slots? We'll revise the time slots available for the solution. So we'll put out another, this will be version five, I'll update. We'll have Saturday day and times, Sunday days and times where you can get on the system to observe what's going on at the Association for Endangered Species, APHES. That's what we're dealing with here. Uh, any questions about the solution before we get started? How's the audio on your end? It's fine. Yeah, we can hear you. That's good. So what I would like to do is take a moment to call out this addendum. We had started at one point to talk about ethics and law in our module. <clears throat> and just to summarize, so many of our ethical standards start like the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not, one through eight, right? But there are two at the end that are stated like thou shalt, right? And uh, just remember that impersonation is, is, is one of those tipping points. So whenever you have somebody that's impersonating another, that's where the trouble begins. Usually if people are authentic and genuine and they're doing things in a digital world, that they would otherwise do in the real world, then uh, then they're usually good, unless they're a criminal in the real world. If they steal things in the real world and they're stealing things with digital means, then it's no different, right? So that's just one of the rules of thumb that is helpful in discerning or determining where you stand about the legalities of a matter, right? So the last part of our uh, module focus is on cyber law and ethics. And what I'd like to do is begin at the end. What we'd like to do is walk through the, the uh, summary of law and ethics. It's uh, module six or chapter six in your textbook. Uh, we are in module three of the course, just so we keep everybody thoroughly confused. Uh, let's begin. So laws are formally adopted rules for acceptable behavior in modern society. However, ethics are socially acceptable behavior. The key difference between laws and ethics is that laws carry the authority of a governing body and ethics do not. Now, in simple terms, ethics can be, uh, in general, it is possible for a matter to be ethical but not legal and, and the other way around. Um, although in general, if you are operating ethically, you're usually on, in, good, in a good place when it comes to the law. If you're doing something that's unethical, the odds are very high that there are laws against such a thing. So that's another rule of thumb, right? When we talk about ethics, though, it's the social group or social environment about what's acceptable or isn't. So it's relative in that sense. It could be that ethics among certain circles of individuals or social groups, social networks, Certain things are hack are, are uh, hack worthy, right? They're, it's okay to do, and 
you know, people make a game out of it and it's acceptable. And then in other, but uh, when it comes to the law, the same things that seem cool to do in front of a group can often get you into trouble uh, very, very quickly. We did share in class, I think, this idea of doxing and how someone had called a, a central dispatch 911 and called out someone as if their house was being, you know, a home invasion. And the individual that was on the receiving end of that SWAT team stepped out onto the porch, didn't understand what was going on, uh, panicked and moved in what was considered to be a threatening manner at the time and was gunned down by law enforcement. So those are the kinds of things that, you know, might be cool in the gaming network world, but it's not, it's not legal to, so organizations formalize desired behavior in documents called policies. So the thing to understand about policies is that policies are formally adopted rules. They're written just like laws. They carry the same weight in terms of consequences. So if there is a policy against doing certain things with your technology at work, and you violate those policies, it's usually not long before there is some kind of, uh, you are bound to a standard of activity and a standard of operation. And if you violate those things, the policies can be, become the basis for disciplinary action up to and including termination from the organization, right? So, so policies are very much like the law of an organization. Any questions about policy? Civil law. When we say civil law, we're not talking about criminal, we're talking about something called tort. Has anyone ever heard of the term tort? Can you repeat what you said? Civil law comprises a wide variety of laws that govern a nation or state, but oftentimes when we refer to in the U.S. Uh, in the U.S. mainland, when we're talking about civil law, oftentimes it involves something called court or litigation. Does anyone? Nah. It's a lawsuit. So you have law that allows one organization to go after another with, with a civil law. So a civil case is based on a lawsuit and it's one party against another that's breached a contract, right? So usually when there are lawsuits because of harm or violations, that can be something that's ethical. You could have a company that's, that's uh, disposing of chemicals that are not technically considered to be toxic, but it's to an excess where people are getting sick and they get sued. So civil cases can arise even when lawful cases do not. The thing to understand is that in the US federal government, when we talk about civil cases, we're talking about lawsuits or what's known as tort law, T-O-R-T. Criminal law addresses violations that harm society or individuals and is enforced by agents of the, of the state or nation. So the, the, the preliminary or, or uh, and, and this is just common sense, everybody knows this, but in terms of the purest definition, when you have criminal law violation, someone from the government is coming after you. And, and it's the government that's going to pursue action in a court against you. Any questions or comments, observations at this point? Can someone? Mm, nope, not for me. All right, that's what I needed. I just needed to know if folks were still here yet. Well, um, when does um when does a company really know? That they should contact law enforcement or any any federal agency. That's I mean, a, I, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. No, that's a great question. So the the question was, when does 
a company understand that they need to contact law enforcement. So every company is likely to have a personnel department or human resources management department, yes? Yeah. And the personnel manager and the HR director, the people who manage personnel for that company are familiar with the local policies, right? And sometimes policies will have a blanket clause in them that says something like, uh, it is the policy of this organization that all employees will operate in a lawful and ethical manner, period. So the local policy points to the law. Now, when a matter arises and the HR and administration is informed about a breach or a violation, if it doesn't trigger something locally, but it's serious, they tag in their legal counsel. So it's quite often that an organization would formally retain the services of a lawyer. And it's the lawyer that's the specialist in the, the law of, the, of that given jurisdiction. So we have territorial law, but then we also have federal law. And Milrain, you mentioned an excellent point because we may not break territorial law, but there's a possible, in a, in a violation, it could be possible that we actually breach or, or we're dealing with a, a break in US federal law because we're a US territory as well, right? So the, so the degree, that's where that's why jurisdiction can be so tricky. Remember that that the local jurisdiction, if it has a more stringent law, that law overrules or overrides the less restrictive uh, national or international law, and vice versa. So if it's terribly law, unlawful for the, anyone in the United States of America, generally, anywhere in the world, to do a certain thing. But in, um, in the US Virgin Islands, it's, it's okay to do a thing. Then the federal, the US federal standard overrides the local law. It's the jurisdictional question that gets tricky. So the short answer is, we usually consult a good bit with legal counsel, but we're going to, I'm going to give you uh, a basic review of the primary laws that matter the most. So the other part of this question, Milrain, is by the time we finish this review, you'll know what the Federal Privacy Act is about. And if something happens in digital devices or systems or on a network, and it doesn't comply with the standards of the Federal Privacy Act of 1974, even though computers weren't commonly available back then, then you know that the law has been broken. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. The Electronic Communications Privacy Act, you are entitled to privacy for your electronic communications, right? So those are, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna help flesh out some of the some of the basic rules of engagement. So everybody knows from a glance, okay, there's private medical digital records that were exposed and the standards of HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, H-I-P-A-A. -A. A lot of times people misspell it and they say H-I-P-P-A. It's H-I-P-A-A. If digital health records have been compromised and exposed, unauthorized access, that is jail time and a $50,000 fine for each offense. Jail time, right? So that's criminal because of the way the law was written. So uh, we'll, hopefully we'll, we'll give you the basics and then the rest you refer to the legal team. Glad you asked the, I'm glad you asked that question. So private law focuses on individual relationships. Public law governs regulatory agencies. When we say private law, we're talking about civil lawsuits, 
between organizations, like one one nonprofit suing uh, a for-profit company or a community is suing uh, an individual. When, when you have when you have a government agency that's taking on someone, that's different. That's public law, and and that often hits on criminal. So key U.S. laws to protect privacy include the Federal Privacy Act. The U.S. government determined in 1974 that U.S. citizens uh, were entitled to privacy and that their personal private information could not be violated uh, by the government or by anybody. If you were sharing private information about someone, you can go to jail. That's been long since 1974. The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act of 1984 has to do with the uh, fraud and abuse of federal computer systems. There was a hacker that compromised some federal computer systems and went to jail uh, for the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, that's CFAA. Not long after that, people were getting into everyone's Kool-Aid with email. Email was a thing. And then before long, people were violating privacy with email. They were reading each other's email. So 1986, and of course, we've already talked about uh, digital health records, right? Everybody knows about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, yeah? DMCA? Mm, no, I'm first one here, voted. When you watch a movie, have you ever seen an FBI logo at the start of a movie? Yeah. Yes. That is part of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. That is a law that says that content, the artistic works, music, movies, artwork, written work, you know, written uh, products like uh, books and magazine, copyrighted, right? They're protected, and if people are stealing that that media, that that intellectual property, it's an intellectual property concern. It's, it's the creative work of an individual or a band or a team or a group or a company, patents, right? Uh, if you copy uh, stuff that you're not entitled to, uh, you get in trouble. That's the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, there are other international laws. So U.S. copyright law extends this privilege to publish works, including electronic media. So that's the DMCA uh, law. The desire to protect national security, trade secrets, and a variety of other state and private assets has led to the passage of several laws. Has anyone ever heard of the Patriot Act? Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. So after 9-11, the U.S. government said, you know what, to protect our national security, we're going to allow the U.S. government to monitor certain digital information. Of course, later they found out that there were some abuses and there were some changes to the law since then. Right. An individual by the name of Edward Snowden was an employee of the United States and he released over a million classified documents on the internet and then fled the country to go to Russia because he found out that the U.S. government was spying on their own citizens, even though there was no security issue, spying on their own uh, allies, their own colleagues, not just threats. They just, it was a runaway freight train, right? So the U.S. government had to answer for this, and there were changes as a result. So the original Patriot Act is still, there are certain components of the original Patriot Act that are still in play, but it's been it's been changed. It's been updated. So there's a new, uh, it's like a, the new and improved uh, Patriot Act. Studies have determined that people of differing nationalities have varying perspectives on ethical practices while the use with the use of computer technology. So if we're talking about certain nations, uh, it might or might not be illegal to do certain things, right? 
But that doesn't mean that you're cause you're not causing a problem if you're doing it across the internet and now you're well, you're engaging US citizens, right? Or you're engaging other citizens. Deterrence can prevent an illegal or unethical activity from occurring. Deterrence requires significant penalties, a high probability of apprehension, and an expectation that penalties will be enforced. So has anyone ever seen the login logo when you go to a US, um, the University of Virgin Islands computer system and you go to log in? It, it's a splash screen. It's called a banner. It comes up and it says, hey, uh, when, you, when you click and you enter your password, you're agreeing to ethical standards of use and you're agreeing to the fact that we're monitoring the networks and our systems to prevent illegal or unethical activity. And you're supposed to use this for university purposes only, right? So, so that kind of screen comes up. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can show it to you. Basically, I can remote into the uh, like the classroom machine and uh, that thing will pop up. So that's part of deterrence. If it says on that splash screen, on that banner, unauthorized or illegal use may result in disciplinary action up to and including re referral to criminal authority, you know, to legal authorities, right? Deterrence doesn't mount, it doesn't help, it doesn't work, it's broken if it doesn't mean that that when people are caught, they're slapped on the wrist. It's like, oh, you're a bad person. Don't do that again, right? There have to be significant penalties. There has to be a high probability of apprehension and the expectation that penalties will be enforced. I did tell you about a student that was on our network that downloaded pornography. I did I did share that, right? It was a, yeah. research, a research network and it was the first of its kind. This is about five years ago. And a student from St. Thomas didn't want to, I don't know, uh, go into the weeds with their own network. So they used the new research network at our campus. And when they downloaded the nasty stuff, the, uh, the, the published works, right? This, the studio for that adult content backtraced the IP address to the individual on St. Thomas, right? And, and yeah, there were penalties that were enforced, right? Otherwise, deterrent doesn't mean anything, right? So deterrent is effective, but only effective if there are significant penalties. That's the condition one. Condition two, you're going to get caught. <laughs> it's only a matter of time. It might not happen right away. By the way, we should talk about this just a moment. Has everyone heard of the story of the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. You know, the most common interpretation of that story by most men is that, oh, it's Eve's fault because she gave the apple to Adam, right? I mean, that's what I've yeah. heard. That's what I've heard. It's not fair. It's not true either. I want you to think about this a second. When I first heard the story about Adam and Eve, I thought, wow, is Adam dumb or what? I didn't automatically assume that it was Eve's fault. I thought, what's with Adam? I mean, why would he cave? Oh, well, you know, they had a good relationship. Yeah, he didn't want to upset Eve. She was saying, hey, you should taste this. This is great. Uh, it, it's going to open your eyes. You'll have knowledge you don't have before, right? But here's why it worked. The serpent. The serpent had a half-truth, and the serpent said, oh, you're not going to die. Oh, what God told you, that's, that's wrong. So God told them, if you touch this, you will die. When Eve took a bite out of the apple, what's the first thing they realized? Was Eve on the ground dead? No. Eve didn't die. Eve wasn't on the ground dead. Not at that time. 
So to Eve, Eve thought she had proof of what? That God was not being straight with them, that God was not serious, that he was trying to keep something from them. She believed the serpent because she wasn't dead on the spot. That's the problem. I want you to understand the original notion of sin has less to do with who to blame and more to do with whether or not people believe it's going to come to roost. If you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing, if you want effective cybersecurity, one thing you have to ensure is that you're watching for it. And when it happens, you bring it home and you set an example. Sacrificial lamb, baby. Slaughter the lamb. Make an example, right? You have to do it. If you don't, you're not establishing the idea that the penalties will be enforced. It is only after the fact, the sad thing, God did not get to Adam before Eve did. And Eve's like, hey, I'm not dead. Look, look, see, it's not true. And now I know all this cool stuff, right? That's the problem. People get in those weeds and they go to the dark web. Oh, and the dark web is so cool. And that's usually right before the hammer drops. Okay. I just... I'm just just sharing a little bit of personal perspective here. Think about the Garden of Eden. Touch the fruit. Avoid this tree and its fruit, lest ye die. I need you to understand that. Now, if you're working cybersecurity, it means you're watching and you're waiting and you're catching it so that somebody else doesn't break a law and then you have a bigger problem on your hands and you have a criminal investigation in your organization. It's better to catch things before they go from bad to worse so that you can deal with them locally. But if there is a law that's broken, you can no longer just deal with it locally. And don't you think the local leadership will try to convince you otherwise? You know how else you go to jail as a cyber professional? When it's time for the penalties to be enforced, if you have local leadership that go, well, you're a paid consultant, you work for us, we're not doing that. I'm like, the hell I am. I'm not going to jail for you, fool. I might have I might have a contract with you, yes. And I do work for you, yes. But I have ethical standards and that's why I'm a professional. And we're not having this conversation. Now, you get with your legal counsel and we'll have a conversation with this after my report is filed. But this is the last time you're telling me that I'm going to go ahead and do something that's wrong and it's unlawful because I ain't wearing prison orange for you, right? You got to be ready to have that conversation. That's This is where the rubber meets the road. And that's not in the textbook, but I've seen it play out in real life. As part of an effort to encourage ethical behavior, many professional organizations have established codes of contact or codes of ethics that their members are expected to follow. One of my favorite is, Ethical hacking. Did you know that if a friend asks you to help find out what's wrong with their system, can you afford to help them to a point? You know, casually. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. But what happens if they say, hey, I think my wife's into something bad here. Hey, I think my spouse is into something bad here. I need proof. I need you to get proof off of their device. Is that ethical? Nope. Nope. Oh, but they're your friend. Oh, well, nobody will know. Nobody will know but us, right? That's that's one of the things that will come your way. This is one reason why cybersecurity professionals who are ethical are worth their weight in gold. And it starts where you would least expect it. Someone you know it's like, oh, I need some help. And you're like, okay, well, I can do this to a point, but after a point, I have to recuse myself. Recusing yourself means you know when to tag out and you're like, okay, I'm out. Because, you know, from here, I don't know what's on that system, but I have the card of a person you can contact and I have to step out because I'm your friend or I'm your family member. 
And I ain't wearing prison orange for you either. I mean, that's what we're really talking about here. Several U.S. federal agencies are responsible for protecting American information resources and investigating threats against them. FBI, National Security Agency, Department of Homeland Security, right? Any questions? All right, we're gonna move a little faster. So the terms are important in the study guide and the addendum. You're gonna find uh, a lot of these definitions are spelled out. You need to understand the difference between ethics and law. So this cultural mores, that's the attitudes or customs of a particular group that feeds into the ethical dynamic. That So cultural mores are part of the ethical dynamic. That's where some things can be considered ethical. And in other cultural contexts, they're not considered ethical. That's worth stating and stating and stating all over again. As long as you know the laws and you handle those at least, uh, then you're, you'll usually stay out of the weeds with ethics. Um, Liability, the legal obligation of an entity extending beyond criminal or contact, contract law. So a lot of times when law is broken, it has to do with contract law. We get, to, we get into tort again, T-O-R-T. -T. Contract, I have an obligation. I'm using your information. You're using my website. When I'm using your information, it's so that you can buy stuff and I can ship it to you. I'm called Amazon. I have a contract with you and it's called an end user license agreement or EULA. Has anybody ever heard of an end user license agreement or EULA? E-U-L-A. Yeah, I've seen yeah. it, I've seen it, yeah. Yes, this is a sticky area for software because a lot of times software publishers will have all this fine print and they'll say, hey, do you agree to, do you agree to this? It's the end user license agreement. That's a contract. You click yes. And whatever's in there, you're obligated to. If they say, well, we're going to share your information. Well, we're going to examine stuff on your system. There are end user license agreements that spell it out just that plainly. And it's nasty. People don't realize they should be reading the end user license agreement. It includes the legal obligation to make restitution. You have to compensate an injured party for wrongs committed. Uh, we've mentioned jurisdiction before, so this is a court's right to hear a case if the wrong was committed in its territory or involved its citizenry or involved its citizens. So it could be that in some cases, the U.S. Virgin Islands court system can still hear a case if it involves a resident of the U.S. Virgin Islands, even if they were somewhere else. Long arm jurisdiction, right? Application of law laws to those residing outside a court's normal jurisdiction. It's usually granted when a person acts illegally within the jurisdiction and leaves. So somebody does something wrong and then they're like, oh, I'm skipping town. You can't do nothing. Nah, 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 nah. Yeah, that would be your first mistake. It's called long arm jurisdiction. We're coming after you. Has anyone ever heard of non extradition treaty countries? No, no, never yeah. been Okay. So long arm jurisdiction means, hey, you leave, I still got gotcha. you. That's what it means in a nutshell. But let's look at something called non extradition countries. There was a case a couple of years ago of a guy that was sharing copyrighted music, digital copyrighted music. And so this individual had to live in a foreign country where there was a non-extradition policy. It means that the long arm of the law can't, it doesn't work. So if you, Edward Snowden went to Russia after he leaked over a million classified documents, 
he would have faced the death penalty for treason to the United States of America. He would have been executed. He left. He's living in Russia. Russia will say, yeah, we don't. Okay, you want him? Yeah, that's not going to work. You can't come and get him. China, United Arab Emirates, Iran, Azerbaijan, Armenia. There are 15 more. Belarus and Eastern Europe, Cuba, Montenegro, that's in Eastern, Southeastern Europe, Bhutan, that is a uh, Asian country, Vietnam, Bahrain, Armenia, Djibouti, Kuwait, Syria, Benin. There's also many island states that are non-extradition countries. It means that the long arm of the law doesn't work. So if you escape and you travel to those countries, um, somebody trying to prosecute you and drag you back isn't going to work. But if you go to Canada or Mexico and you think you're going to escape because you're at Cabo, the moment somebody sees you in Cabo, they're going to call the Mexican police and the Mexican police are going to get you and they will extradite you, which means they will transport you out of the country to return you to the jurisdiction where you will face criminal prosecution. Does that word extradite mean more now? Yes, no, maybe? Yeah, it makes sense. Due diligence. Now this is huge. So when you have due care, there's a legal standard that requires you to do certain things and you have to do them. That's due care. HIPAA is a great example. You have to have firewalls because if you expose personal health care information to somebody who is unauthorized, there's a law that's going to put you in jail. So there's a legal standard for how to protect that information, and you have to abide by that legal standard. That's called due care. Due diligence is one of the most underused shields to protect people in cyber law. And I'm just shocked. Due diligence means... You know the legal standard requiring what a prudent organization would do to maintain the standard of security and due care. And, and you ensure that actions are effective. You do your part. It, the world's not perfect, but you, when you go to court, people find you've done everything reasonable to protect yourself. And on that basis, you've demonstrated what's known as due diligence. A lot of times, you can't be held liable or accountable as long as you documented that you did everything you could that was reasonable and prudent, right? It means you weren't you weren't being you, you weren't be, you weren't being callous or practicing a disregard for the law. You knew the law and you did what you could. And and then here comes a hacker and the hacker ruins everything, but they're not going to throw you in jail because of the due diligence. This is a huge concept. And it's it's safe territory. It's a safe haven or safe harbor for people working in cybersecurity. Do what you can, right? Encrypt information, hash it so that you can guarantee that it's authentic. You know, uh, have security measures in place so that people can't just walk in and take and get into this stuff. That's what due diligence means. Any question about due diligence? No. Now, I'm about ready to close our session. This slide is huge because there's a tipping point between policy and law and you need to understand the difference. So we know that policies are like the local laws of the organization. Okay, we understand that. And it has to do with what's acceptable and unacceptable behavior in the workplace, right? And that organizations have these, they implement them, they train their employees, they're fairly applied to everybody, right? Those are all, you can't have a policy you don't enforce or it's no good, right? But here is another rubber meets the road moment. This is one of those things that bites people all the time. You can say, there, there are many cases that have been settled in court where somebody said, 
really? We have a policy that says I can't do so-and-so? Because people are doing it all the time. And you're not enforcing it consistently. I didn't know we had a policy because I saw XYZ doing this. And then last month, it was such and such that was doing this. I didn't think there was a policy because, frankly, people are just doing it and it's not being enforced consistently. It's not fairly applied to everyone. Ignorance of a policy is an acceptable defense. But look at this next part of the phrase. Ignorance of law is not. What am I saying? You can't anywhere, you can't go into any court of law and say you don't know about HIPAA. You didn't know that digital health records are protected by federal law. And if you if you do something to expose those health information records, you're going to jail. When you get into a courtroom, it's like saying, honestly, I had a fight. I knew that he was trying to hurt me. Um, and I was just trying to protect myself by killing the man. I didn't know there was a law against doing that. Oh, yeah, there is, right? So there are different degrees of assault and manslaughter, right? So this gets kind of touchy, but you know this in, in instinctively. If you're pulled over by an officer and you're going way over the speed limit, I mean, can you say, I didn't know we didn't have a seatbelt law? Is that going to work? No. No. In fact, they're putting out ads. Hey, we're going to ticket you if you don't have a seatbelt on. Right? Have you seen the ads? The VIPD has put out ads about seatbelts. It's like, Hey, oh, you can't... yeah, I've seen ads, but I don't think I've seen the Yeah, they pull somebody over and they have this conversation with the law officer and they're like, I didn't know that because she was in the back seat, she had to have uh, a seat a seat belt on. You're like, no, sorry, I'm still writing this ticket for you, right? Ignorance of the law is not a defense, but ignorance of policy may be a defense under certain circumstances. Like if the organization doesn't fairly apply or if they don't take the time to educate people about their policies. They don't enforce the policy. They don't, they don't conduct orientation about the policy. They don't hold people accountable for the policy. That's a policy that just doesn't work. Okay. Now, policy versus law. So policy enforcement, you have dissemination, distribution, reading, comprehension, agreement, and uniform enforcement. Those are the steps of making policy work. Law works different. Business policy function as blank laws and must be crafted. What's the answer here? Organizational. Organizational is correct. Very good. It's the organizational law. Okay. Now, does everybody remember the thing I said about tort? Yes. Okay, regulatory is when the governor says, thou shalt do this, or his agency leads say, hey, I'm requiring such and such. That's regulatory or administrative, right? Court law or case law is when they make a decision, private versus public, constitutional. There's a lot of cyber law that comes from our U.S. Constitution. We are entitled to the same constitutional rights in the digital world as we are in the real world. That is one of the most important and cherished things I want you to know as we close out for the week. Does anyone have any observations, comments, questions before we clear today? No. no.